Greetings, this is Jeff Riddle. I'm the pastor of Christ Reformed Baptist Church in Louisa, Virginia. Welcome to this edition of Word Magazine. This is probably going to be a briefer Word Magazine, as I want to review and discuss a little bit a post that was placed to Twitter or X uh, this week relating to textual criticism, and in particular to the goal of textual criticism. And this was a post that was placed uh, to the Twitter or X account of Dirk Youngkin, written by Dirk Youngkin. Uh, Dirk Youngkin uh, is the vice principal of the Tyndale House, uh, an evangelical sort of think tank in Cambridge, England. And uh, he is the editor of the Tyndale House Greek New Testament. I wrote a review of this when it came out in 2017. That review was, on, it was in the Puritan Reform Journal. Uh, and it's also available to be read on my academia.edu page. And then he also wrote a little uh, follow-up to that, which was an introduction to the Greek New Testament uh, that was published uh, at, uh, at Tyndall uh, in Cambridge. And this is interesting because it, it revealed a little bit of his philosophy on uh, the text of Scripture, some of his theology, some of his bibliology, also wrote a review of this book that was in the Puritan Reform Journal uh, and is available on my academia.edu page. And I had a couple of interactions, I think, with uh, Dr. Yonkind online, and I generally ha have found him in those interactions to be uh, quite a charitable person. Um, however, I thought that his comments that he made uh, on his Twitter account that we're going to look at uh, were very intriguing and interesting related to the whole question of the shift in the goal of textual criticism. And a number of times I've made the point uh, on this podcast and in other places that there has been a decisive shift from the old modern goal, which was to recover the original or the autograph, to the, the, the goal of textual criticism as it's articulated now in the 21st century, which is a much more modest goal uh, to establish the initial text or the Ausgangs text, or to simply describe historically uh, the transmission of the text. And I think that comes through pretty clearly in this brief um, uh, thread that we're going to look at. I was also thinking about this in relationship following up on the podcast that I recently put up reviewing this book uh, edited by Abidon Paul Shaw and David Allen Black, Can We Recover the Original Text of the New Testament? And uh, in this work, uh, Shaw and Black were saying, yes, there has been this change in the goal of modern textual criticism, but there are still evangelicals who are attempting to restore the original, who are still uh, seeking the old goal. And we have kind of now a test case for this as we look at uh, some of the thoughts of Dirk Youngkin. So let me go ahead and pull up, if I can, uh, Dr. Youngkin's uh, Twitter profile. And so we'll look at this. This is his Twitter profile. He's the academic vice principal at Tyndall House, which is an international center for biblical studies. And he's also an affiliated lecturer uh, for the Faculty of Divinity um, at uh, Cambridge University. And so the, 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 the post, the thread that we wanna look at uh, was put up yesterday, it's January the 19th of 2024. And, uh, he wrote the following. He said, prepping for my yearly course teaching New Testament textual criticism. I'm not sure if he's teaching this at the Tyndall House or if he's teaching this at Cambridge, but um, he apparently teaches this every year. And he asked the question, what is the goal of textual criticism? And that is a great question. What is the goal of textual criticism? How will Dr. Young can answer this question? Will he say the goal is to restore, recover the original text, the autograph, or will he say something else? 
And so let me uh, pull up uh, the rest of the thread. Um, here is his second post. He says, my answer, the goal of textual criticism is to describe the history of the writing or the wording rather of a text on the basis of the documents that carry the text, i.e. manuscripts, inscriptions, etc. Now let's pause for a second. Remember his question is what is the goal of textual criticism? He's asking, I guess, the people who follow him on Twitter, how will they answer this question? And notice he says the goal of textual criticism is it doesn't say to restore the original, uh, to, to recover the autograph, but he says the goal of textual criticism is simply to describe the history of the wording of a text on the basis of the documents that carry the text. So the goal is no longer restoration of the autograph. The, the goal is descriptive. Uh, it is... Uh, to um, study the transmission history, the, the reception history of the text. And this sounds very much like uh, some of the things that Bart Ehrman uh, wrote in uh, the late 20th, early 21st centuries, when he talked about the, the goal of textual criticism not being the recovery of the autograph, but providing windows into early Christianity or early Christianities. And so, again, this is evidence of this shift in the modern goal of textual criticism. Uh, Dr. Young can, uh, continues. This is the third of five posts. He says, this includes finding the oldest wording. Let me pause here. Notice he doesn't say this includes finding the original wording or finding the authorial text or finding the autograph, but it simply means finding the oldest wording. And this sounds like uh, the kind of description that has been influenced by Gerd Mink, by the coherence-based genealogical method, by the idea that the goal of textual criticism is to restore the so-called initial text or Ausgang's text, not the authorial text, not the original text, but the text as far back as we can go, maybe the second, maybe the third century, um, but it's not what Paul wrote, what Matthew wrote, what Mark wrote. It's only the oldest wording that we can at best recover. Um, and then he says, but also, not, not only that, but also subsequent developments, versions, et cetera. So again, it's the study of the reception history or the transmission history of the text. And he gives an interesting example. He says, when studying, say, the reformers, you don't want the oldest Greek text, but instead the text the reformers had access to. And that's just filled with so many presuppositions. This presupp uh, presupposes that the reformers didn't have the original. And uh, so he says, we don't need to worry about the oldest Greek text. And I guess he means we don't need to worry about the oldest extant manuscripts like Vaticanus or Sinaiticus. Uh, we, when we're talking about the, the, the text as it was used in the age of the reformers, that's a defective text. And we can just simply study uh, historically what was accessible uh, to them. And again, gone is any notion that we can reconstruct the original. Now we can only give a historical snapshot of what was possessed in particular uh, centuries or ages or eras in the life of the, of, of the church. So uh, quite a, an interesting presentation. I think he chose uh, to, to, as for this example, the age of the reformers, uh, probably because there is on his uh, radar screen the fact that there are those who still are holding to the traditional text, the Reformation text, the Protestant text, but he's downplaying that text by saying it's not, it doesn't reflect the oldest Greek text, the oldest that can be recovered 
but simply a late defective text of some sort, even though he doesn't make any claim to being able to restore the original. Uh, he continues in this fourth post, uh, my definition excludes any higher criticisms, such as source and redaction criticism. Uh, these are concerned with questions that precede the documents we have access to, though there can be a gray area, but hardly relevant for the New Testament. I find this interesting. He's wanting to distinguish this uh, type of 21st century textual criticism he's doing from the 19th century, early 20th century uh, pursuit of uh, out of modern historical criticism of the disciplines of source criticism and redaction criticism. When we think about source criticism and the New Testament, we might think especially of the synoptic gospels and the so-called solutions to the synoptic problem. Uh, someone like B.H. Streeter, uh, who said in 1925, uh, that there was there were four sources for the Synoptic Gospels. There was Mark, there was Q, there was M, there was L. Uh, redaction criticism, he's talking about people like Martin Debalius and others who said that there were oral traditions and then there were redactors who simply strung these traditions together like pearls uh, on, a, on a string. And uh, and, and, of course, source criticism and redaction criticism basically say that the text of the Bible is not historically accurate. It wasn't composed by eyewitnesses. And he's trying to distance textual criticism from those disciplines. I, from, from my perspective, I think we could say that there are many ways in which if modern textual criticism didn't originate from source criticism, it was certainly influenced by it. And I think about it, modern textual criticism is about, it was about trying to remove the, the, the corruptions, remove the barnacles from the hull, and get back to the primitive original. Um, and it was influenced by the spirit of that age, I think by um, Darwinian evolution and the application of it to various other types of disciplines. Uh, we're going to remove the corruptions and go back to the original. Um, again, that was the old goal, uh, but he's here, here trying to distance uh, his approach from uh, source criticism and from redaction criticism of the 19th and early 20th century. And so with that said, he goes on and asks the question uh, in his fifth and final uh, post in this thread, any suggestions for improvement? Um, and uh, he starts off with a comment that he himself adds. He says, by the way, this started with my dissatisfaction with the answer uh, by Paul Moss. Let me go ahead, by the way, and get rid of this um, ad, annoying ad that's there. So we can just read the uh responses here. So he says, this started with my dissatisfaction with the answer by Paul Moss. The business of textual criticism is to produce a text as close as possible to the original constitutio textus, the constituting or founding text. Um, so it's interesting. He's saying he thinks the goal is not to try to produce a text as close as possible to the original. Um, he, he's not trying to restore the autograph. He's not trying to restore the original, nor a text as close as possible to it. I think what he's saying is he doesn't think that's possible. The best he can do is restore the, the oldest wording that can be uncovered. And this is the whole initial text type of language. Uh, not back to Paul, Ma Matthew, Mark, Luke, but simply the so-called initial text or Ausgang's text. Um, and so there are a couple of interesting little comments that were added here. Um, Peter uh, Malik uh, wrote, to write a thesis, what's the goal of textual criticism? To write a thesis that'll get you a series of fixed term academic positions. And of course, he's writing this tongue in cheek. And I don't mean to dig on him, but there is a little bit of truth in here. 
And he's saying, well, what's the goal of textual criticism? Well, for the goal, the goal for many people who start in these high profile academic uh, programs at these respected universities, their goal is to do a PhD and write a PhD thesis that will get them an academic, tenured academic position. And he's sort of uh, here um, um, saying, you know, ironically, it's to write a thesis that'll get you a series of fixed term academic positions. And I think what he's saying is, even though he went to one of these high priest prestige universities, and, went, and, and despite the fact that he did this work and did a PhD in textual criticism, in this very difficult academic market, he hasn't been able to find that tenured position teaching in a university or seminary or divinity school. And instead, he's having to rely on taking a series of fixed term academic positions to get by. Again, I'm sure he meant this, you know, as a joke, as tongue in cheek, and I'm not digging on him for that. But again, it sort of reveals quite a bit. He's right. The, 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 the whole academic textual criticism industry, uh, well, the, the whole uh, academic textual criticism um, approach is an industry. It's an academic industry. And it relies on people who enter into these programs and who do this study to get these degrees and to get a degree, you don't get a degree and you, you don't get your thesis approved by affirming the tradition. You get a degree through innovation and you get this degree and that's why you do textual criticism. You do textual criticism to get your degree so that you can get uh, a teaching position. Um, there's some truth to that. Uh, Peter Gurry uh, chimes in. And uh, he says, again, this is another tongue in cheek answer, and I'm not digging on it for it, but there, there, again, there's some underlying truth in this. He says, to have fun. What's the goal of textual criticism? It's to have fun. Um, and we might just make the observation, of course, that textual criticism, the goal of textual criticism, should not be for our intellectual amusement. And human beings have been given intelligence by God. We enjoy solving difficult problems. And there are some people, no doubt, who enjoy textual criticism because they like being able to study these manuscripts and uh, trying to come up with theories about which one influenced this other one and how do you separate separate these disparate traditions and so forth. And I know Peter Gray didn't mean this seriously, but it does uncover something serious, that textual criticism should not be about intellectual amusement or intellectual recreation. Um, it's kind of interesting actually looking back uh, on this thread that a lot of the things that Dirk Yonkin says here about textual criticism really seem don't to not be specific to the Bible itself. Although he says it's he's prepping to teach a course on New Testament textual criticism, he asked simply, what is the goal of textual criticism? And in the rest of his responses, he doesn't really say anything about the Bible being a special case with respect to its text because it's inspired, because it's autopistic, because it's been preserved by the singular care and providence of God. In fact, I think the things he says about text here I'm guessing he would apply to secular texts if you were trying to restore the texts of the writings of a, uh, a Roman historian or a Greek philosopher. But wouldn't it be true that for Christians that, that the, the text of the Bible would be treated in a different category because this is God's word, because it's inspired by God? because it is self-authenticating, because it has been kept pure in all ages by the Lord. So uh, anyways, I, I think that this little um, uh, look at this thread shows us, I think, some of the realities of the shift in uh, academic textual criticism 
even among those who would be self-identified evangelicals. And I was I was thinking again back to this little book that I recently reviewed and what the co-editor said at the very end of the book in their conclusion on page 87. And I think I read this uh, in my review of it, but on page 87, they wrote, lack of a settled original text only leads to a lack of a settled biblical theology, which only leads to uncertain Christian doctrines and practice. They proceed to say, thankfully, there are still many who continue to practice a scientific approach to retrieving the original text of the New Testament, albeit from different starting points and assumptions regarding textual history. And my question for them would be, um, I agree with you, absolutely. When, when there is a lack of a settled original text, it only leads to a lack of a settled biblical theology, and that leads to uncertain Christian doctrines and practice. But you're telling me, oh, but mm, don't worry, because there are evangelicals who are still pursuing the reconstruction of the original text using a scientific approach. And my question is, do you think Dirk Youngkin is one of these people? I mean, is, wouldn't he be an evangelical uh, who is involved in academic textual criticism, but when he defines the goal of textual criticism, he says nothing about attempting to restore the autograph, to restore the original, to um, to restore uh, the authorial text, but he says, no, it's only a matter of, of getting the wording as far back as we possibly can. It's only a matter of trying to describe the transmission history and so um, I think this brief uh, uh, this this brief series of posts, this thread, actually reveals some of the major underlying problems with those evangelicals in particular who are still attempting to hold to textual criticism, academic textual criticism. And this also applies to recent uh, persons who have tried to say, oh, the, the reformers and the Protestant Orthodox, uh, they were just doing the same kind of modern textual criticism that's done today. And that is, I think, an absurd claim. It's an anachronistic claim. Uh, the men of the Reformation, the post-Reformation, the Protestant Orthodox era were not doing the kind of enlightenment influence, modern or postmodern textual criticism that evolved out of the modern historical critical method. Um, it, it seems to me uh, really to be a stretch and it really would be uh, inappropriate to say that they were doing the same kind of textual criticism as modern textual critics. And they certainly were not uh, pursuing either the modern or the postmodern goal of textual criticism. They believed that the Bible was inspired, that it was autopistic, and that it had been providentially preserved by God. And therefore, it was a very distinct, unique approach uh, to understanding the text of Scripture. Well, with that, we'll bring this shorter episode of Word Magazine to a close. I hope this has been helpful, profitable, edifying for those who are listening. And I'll look forward to speaking to you in the next episode of Word Magazine. Till then, take care and God bless.